Uh, yeah, so I'm Rachel, married to um, Tim, and uh, together we lead a church in Birmingham Gas Street, as you've heard. We've got four uh, kids, ranging from nine down to four, and there are many wonderful things about parenting, but one of the things that I particularly like is that uh, our kids often say amusing things without realizing it. Uh, You know, our kids, they're at that age where they're just absorbing tons of information all the time. They're learning new words, new vocabulary all the time. And occasionally they don't quite get the right word in the right context. If you're a parent, you'll know what I mean. And uh, I was chatting to our nine-year-old Phoebe just on the way back from holiday. Can you tell? I've been on holiday. Got a great tan. This is as good as it gets for me in terms of tan. I'm moisturizing to try and keep it going as long as possible. Anyway, I was chatting to my Phoebe in the car, and uh, we were talking about holiday, and I said to her, Phoebes, is there anywhere in the world, in the whole world, if you, if you could go on holiday, where would you choose to go on holiday? Uh, and she said to me, um, do you know what, Mum? I would love to go to New York. And I'm thinking, classy girl. Clearly, she gets that from me. And, uh, and I said, New York, that's awesome. Why, why New York? And she said, you know what? I really want to see the Statue of Puberty. <laughs> I'm like, wonderful. That must be in a, a museum that I've never heard of in New York. Anyway, enough about puberty. I hope you've all been through it. The other side, good. Uh, when, when Rich asked me to speak about uprising, uh, immediately, even on the phone as we were speaking, uh, immediately the, this, um, this bit of scripture popped into my head. It was Ezekiel 37. Some of you will, will know that. In fact, it's referenced here already, so I hope not everybody is speaking on Ezekiel 37. Uh, but it was immediately what came to mind, and clearly uh, God is speaking. God is speaking to us. So um, I would encourage you, be listening. I'm sure that, that sounds so obvious, but I know for me I can come to events and conferences like this, and uh, stuff can... Uh, we can be distracted by so many things. I'd encourage you, tune in. What is God wanting to speak to you about today? Today. So Ezekiel 37, I'm going to read from it in my garishly pink Bible. Don't judge me. I didn't mean to get a pink Bible. It was sort of an accident, but there we go. It's a pink Bible. It's good inside, so that's what matters. Okay, Ezekiel 37. I'm reading from verse 1. I'm not sure whether it's going to pop up on the screen. So if you've got a Bible, phone, whatever, do read with me because we're going to read quite a bit of it right up to verse 14. Okay. It's the valley of the dry bones. Some of you will, will know this already. The hand of the Lord was on me. This is Ezekiel speaking. The hand of the Lord was on me. And he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me to and fro among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breath, from the four winds, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. And breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. 
Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, my people, I'm going to open your graves. I'm going to bring you up from them. I'm going to bring you back to light, brought back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. And then you will know that I am the Lord, that, that the Lord has spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. Ah. Men, it's pretty awesome, isn't it? And when we read these verses together, what we, what we discover is that the key component in that piece of Scripture is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the center point of the scene. And actually, uh, if you look a bit closer, you'll see that the Holy Spirit actually has two roles in this piece of Scripture. Firstly, the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is, is the one inviting Ezekiel almost into this picture, into this vision, the, the, this scene that is laid out before, her, before us. So the Holy Spirit comes alongside Ezekiel. In the message it says, God's Spirit took me up and set me down in the middle of an open plain strewn with bones. It's by the Spirit's invitation. He, he's there with Ezekiel in the middle of this, this strange and desolate scene. And he sees this vision and, and the Holy Spirit begins to sort of coach Ezekiel through it. It says that they walk up and down together. He instructs him on, on what to do. They're, they're in this scene together. But the Holy Spirit also has another role in this piece of scripture. He's active in the scene. He's, he's the one that brings breath and life to these dead bodies, to those that are slain, it says in the Bible. So the Holy Spirit we see here, it's like almost he's the pastor, but he's also the power. He's the comforter, but he's also the catalyst. He's the friend, but he's also the fire. He's the helper, but he's also the healer. And the context for us here is, it's, for Ezekiel, it was a really, really difficult time. For the whole people of Israel, it was a very very difficult and turbulent time for the people of Israel. Ezekiel is a, is a prophet, one of the, the Old Testament prophets. He's a contemporary of Jeremiah. So you've got Jeremiah in Judah, he's prophesying there. And then you've got Ezekiel in Babylon, and he's prophesying there. But you see that the people of Israel, they're, they're in exile at that time. They have been through a huge amount of turmoil. They've seen uh, the city of Jerusalem under siege. The temple has been destroyed. They have lost so much. There have been battles. There have been hardships. They've been desperate and, and displaced, and many, many have died. And Ezekiel has this prophetic call on his life. He, he, he's been given this call to speak the words of God to the people. And it hasn't been great news for a long time. The people of God have turned their backs on God. They, they've walked away from him. They've turned away from his love. And as a result, they have lost their city. They have lost their temple. And many have lost their lives. And it's interesting that Ezekiel is actually uh, in the priestly line. It means that his destiny would have been to be a priest at the temple. And, uh, and many of you will know that, that then that the temple was, was so significant. It was the, the home of the presence of God. And so to have the role of a priest was, was so significant, a huge honor. It, it went down the, the generations, and, and that was Ezekiel's purpose, but the temple is destroyed. And so for Ezekiel personally, he has lost so much. This isn't sort of an abstract situation that he's prophesying into. This is real for him. He's experiencing firsthand the loss and the pain and the devastation that the people of Israel are experiencing. He, we know he will have lost his wife. He's lost his community. He's lost his, his inheritance. He's in a rough place. And then we get to chapter 37, and there's this ray of hope. This ray of hope that breaks in to this scene of despair and destruction. And there's this vision, and the bones, and they're dry, and it's death. 
And, and for Ezekiel, as he looks out with the Holy Spirit at this, this scene before him, it would have been a reminder, a stark reminder of the battlefields, the, the real battlefields that had taken place. And in Jewish culture, it, it was unthinkable that anyone in death would be left out in the open unburied. It was like the ultimate, the final humiliation. And so for bones, this vast amount of bones to just be lying out there in the valley, it's significant in that it's indicative of humiliation. It's worse than death almost. There's death and then there's humiliation in death. And so we know that because the bones are just lying there, they'd have been exposed to wild animals and birds. And so for Ezekiel, it's a powerful picture as he looks out on this scene. And there in the wasteland, there among the Valley of Bones, the Holy Spirit is really showing Ezekiel a picture of his own life. And of course, what Ezekiel will have been experiencing personally is just really a microcosm of, of what the whole Jewish people are experiencing. This would have been deeply personal for Ezekiel, deeply painful, a reminder of everything that he had lost. We read that the bones are very dry, very, very dry. Death, destruction, hopelessness. And it's there. It's in that place that the Holy Spirit wants to meet Ezekiel. The Holy Spirit meets Ezekiel in that place. And before we get to the message of hope, before we hear God declare these amazing plans for the future, for restoration, for salvation, it's like the Holy Spirit wants to confront Ezekiel with his present disappointment. And the sense that I have for us, is it, is it this morning, this afternoon, the sense that I have for us this afternoon is that before we start to get excited about all that God is doing, all, all that God can do, all that God will do, all that he wants to do out there is that we just take a moment to allow the Holy Spirit to speak into what might be going on in here. And I think like Ezekiel, I think the Holy Spirit wants to meet us in our own valleys, amongst our own dry bones. For some of us, it might be that you're here and you can put on a really good, brave face, but you know you're just spiritually really dried up. And even as we talk about these dry bones, you think, oh, that's how I feel. That is how I feel right now. For some of you, you know you've allowed um, cynicism to creep in, and the sense that I had is that it was to do with comparison. You know, social media is a wonderful tool, but it's also very good at helping us to compare ourselves to everyone else. And I wonder if for some here, you know that you've been comparing yourself, maybe even in a ministry sense, comparing successes, and it's, it's caused you to grow cynical inside. And I think for others, you feel a sense of disappointment and disillusionment. And I think the Holy Spirit is saying, I want to walk with you in that place today. You guys are on the front line. I mean, what you're doing, it, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. I mean, I think of my own university experience. I grew up as a Christian, uh, but I headed off to university, and I decided that I was going to kind of leave God at home. I never stopped believing in God, but I, I really wanted to pursue that kind of quintessential student existence, and you all know exactly what that means. Uh, it was 20 years ago, but I don't think things have changed that much. And I... I wasn't that interested in pursuing anything particularly godly, quite the contrary, actually. And I look back at that time, and I realize there was such opposition, such a key time. And, and praise God, I left uni, and, and God set me on a, a different course, and everything changed. But you guys are in a battlefield. The enemy hates what you're doing. 
absolutely hates what you're doing. And he will use anything. He will use undealt with cynicism or disappointment or disillusionment to, to undermine what it is he's calling you to do. He wants to discourage you. It's, it, we don't want to give him too much airtime, but let's not be naive enough to think that he doesn't have a scheme to try and undermine and discourage what it is you're doing. It's amazing. It's amazing what you're doing. And so it's so important that we allow the Holy Spirit into those valleys, into those dry, even places for some of, of death for some of you. It's tough, isn't it? Ministry is amazing, but it, it can be tough. Let's be honest about that. This is the sort of environment we can be honest about the reality of that. Stuff doesn't always go according to plan, does it? I can think of a time um, where Tim and I had, had uh, our two youngest were born. They were two and one at the time, and uh, and. We decided to take a holiday, a much-needed holiday, and some friends of ours had told us how wonderful Cornwall was. We're never going back to Cornwall again. But we, we decided to take their advice and go to Cornwall for a, a long weekend. And it was a complete disaster, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I can't blame Cornwall entirely, but it rained the whole time. So we arrived... It rained, we woke up, it rained some more. And then on our second morning, our children both got this thing called hand, foot and mouth. Uh, and it basically leaves them with blisters all over their fingers and inside their mouths. And they were utterly, utterly miserable. And so we're trying to enjoy ourselves. And I, I built up what this holiday was going to be. It was, it was only a few days, but we needed the rest, we needed the break. And I was excited, I had these such high expectations for how it would be, and, and, and I could feel my expectations sort of dipping and dipping and dipping. And so, you know, our kids were not getting better, and on the final morning, we kind of packed up early, decided to, to get in the car, and we began to drive home, and the kids were in such a huge amount of, uh, of pain and discomfort. They just screamed. I mean, they were screaming and screaming and screaming. And again, if you're a parent and you're trapped inside a car with screaming children, it is one of the most stressful scenarios. I think in those moments, if I was withholding state secrets, I'd be like, I I'll say anything <laughs> to make this stop right now. And so we're traveling, and um, about an hour into the journey, finally... The kids had fallen asleep in the back of the car. Tim, I was driving. Tim had also nodded off. And, and it was a, a relatively quiet dual carriageway. And about, I don't know, 200 meters up in front of me, um, this dog just appears out of the bushes. You know, it's just like in the middle of nowhere. I see this dog, and he's, he's on the hard shoulder. And I'm on the inside lane, the one that's nearest to the hard shoulder. I never remember which that was. Uh, that one, that lane. And... The dog is sort of now making its way across the hard shoulder, and I'm thinking, turn around. Like, well, what are you, you, stupid dog, turn around. But it doesn't. It keeps coming. So then I move out into whatever that lane is. I move out there. It just keeps on coming. By now, you know, the trajectory is not looking good, and the dog just keeps on coming. And by then, I've got no option. And so I, I just slam on the brakes, I, I, I shouted some rude words, I'll be honest with you, and I just collided at 70 miles an hour with this dog. And, and Tim was awake, the kids are screaming again, I pulled back onto the hard shoulder, and I'm sitting like, is the dog okay? Is the dog okay? And Tim's like, well, the body's that way, and the head is that way. <laughs> oh. And so I'm just feeling so, I'm dog lo I just got a puppy this week, so dog lovers, I'm with you. But I, I, I'm just sitting in my car, like shaking, oh, feeling horrible, awful, awful, awful. The police come, the, the car is really badly damaged, but drivable. The kids are screaming again. And so we get back in the car, we carry on driving. And by now, you know, the journey is getting longer and longer. And the kids are just screaming, screaming, scream, endless screaming. I can remember we pull off into the service station thinking, right, we'll, we'll just have to get out of the car. And so I'm holding, I'm holding Phoebe, who's two. Tim takes Simeon, who's one, off to the toilet. And I'm walking in the service station. Phoebe is like, I want my mummy. And I'm thinking, I am your mummy. But she's just hysterical. I want your, my mummy. I want my mummy. And then suddenly people are looking at me and they're thinking 
this woman has abducted this poor child. So then we're back on the road. And, and again, parents, Tim and I like starting to niggle at each other because when you've got no one else to blame, you just blame each other. And eventually, we make our way home. And it'd been a long, long day f- following a fairly miserable and disappointing holiday. And I, and I said to Tim, you know what? Once the kids are in bed, I'm just going to go straight up to bed. I am done. And so I, I, headed, I headed up to bed, and um, I noticed that Tim had put this on my pillow. That's his sick sense of humor for you. <laughs> Suffice to say, I didn't speak to him that evening, no. I was disappointed. That was the point of that story. I was disappointed. I'd built up this expectation of what it was going to be like. And by the end, I just felt so disappointed, so discouraged. And the truth is, ministry can be a bit like that. When we were in love, that's it. That was the point. Thank you. It's okay. It gets better. It gets better. Actually, in London, Tim and I were part of a great church um, called HTB. And... At the time, I was primarily at home, and God had laid on my heart this this burden to reach out to to people in our community. And we were there 10 years, and and I'd been praying and praying for our neighbors uh, over this period, praying for the the people that we'd meet at the nursery school, in the local park, you know, in the restaurant, in town. Our neighbors, we'd pray, we'd invite them all over for Christmas and and play dates and various events. If you don't know what a play date is, it sounds weird. It's it's perfectly normal. And um, and anyway, I'd been praying and praying and praying, and, and I had, and I'd invited loads of them to, to loads of different stuff at church. You know, church, at Christmas services, Alpha, I'd, I'd invited them all. And, and most people hadn't responded to, this invita- to these invitations, and, and I, couldn't, I couldn't get it. And so I was asking God, you know, what do I do? And I had this sense that I should just run an Alpha course in my home. That way people couldn't really make excuses because they lived right there. And I thought, this is inspired. This is it. We're going to see revivals sweep through Putney, which is where I was living. I was so excited, so excited. And I emailed about 30 of, of our, our immediate neighbors. And, and I fasted, and I prayed, and I thought, this is it. This is it. This is the moment when it's all going to happen. All my prayers are going to be fulfilled. And over the next few days, one by one, pretty much they all said no. Stuff doesn't always pan out the way that we want it to. And we can can find ourselves weighed down by failure and disappointment. And it robs us of hope. It can rob us of faith. But as we get back to Ezekiel, we see that the Holy Spirit doesn't leave Ezekiel in that place. He doesn't leave Ezekiel in that place of disappointment and destruction and devastation. But first of all, he asks him this question. He says to Ezekiel, can these bones live? And of course he knows the answer. Don't you find sometimes God asks you questions that he already knows the answer to? I can remember praying just a couple of weeks ago. And I was saying to God, I really need you to speak to me about this. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm feeling... I'm feeling like you're not coming through on this, God. And then I I opened up my Bible, and immediately it fell to Matthew 9, 27. In the message translation, it's this this moment where um, these, these, I I think it's a a blind and a, a mute guy asking Jesus if he would heal them. And this is what Jesus says. He says, do you really believe I can do this? And I knew that God was speaking straight to me at that moment. He sometimes wants to see where our faith is at. And of course, Ezekiel answers in a beautifully humble way. Well, only you know. Only you know, sovereign God. And then the Holy Spirit asks him to prophesy over the bones. Asks him to speak words of life over these dry bones. 
That must have been pretty hard for Ezekiel as he looks out over that scene. It must have been pretty hard to, to see what he would assume is impossible and then begin to speak words of life and hope over the scene before him. And I think for us, God is asking us to do the same thing. And as Ezekiel begins to prophesy, something happens. There's this rattling sound, this noise begins. And then Ezekiel is asked to prophesy again. It doesn't happen just straight away. And I think it's a clue, isn't it, for us? We need to persevere. I think sometimes we can give up so quickly and God's saying, keep going. Keep doing it. Do it again. Prophesy again. Commit to speaking words of life and hope, even in a place of disappointment, even in that place of failure. And of course, this isn't simply about Ezekiel's own sense of personal disappointment. The picture is so much bigger than that. He feels it for the whole of his people, for the whole Jewish people, all of God's people. He's longing that he would see the people walking with God again. Isn't that our longing? That we would see our students walking with God. But there's a problem. These bodies, they've been pieced together in the flesh. They've got their muscles and the skin. and It's all come back together, but there's no breath. There's no breath in them. And, and Ezekiel knows that without the breath, without the ruah, that, that, that Hebrew word, without the spirit of God, he too is just like one of those dead bodies. And so many of us, I know for me, I can realize in moments that I've just been ministering like one of those dead bodies in, in the flesh. We desperately need more of the breath of God. We desperately need more of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we forget that as children of God, the Holy Spirit, the power of God in us, it's our birthright. It's what sets us apart from everybody else. We carry the resurrection power within us. And of course, this scene of Ezekiel, it's, it's reminiscent of, of Pentecost that happens Years and years later, and I love it in the book of Luke, right at the end of the book of Luke, Jesus says to his disciples, he, he gives them a hint about what's going to happen at Pentecost. He says, you're going to be clothed with power. You're going to be clothed with power. And for some of us, I wonder if it's, if it's this. We, we ask the Holy Spirit to clothe us with power. Maybe we have a great kind of, profound Holy Spirit encounter, but then we, we step on campus and we suddenly feel small. We suddenly forget that the power lies within us. The Holy Spirit hasn't gone anywhere. He, he went ahead of us. We are clothed with power. Let me tell you about a, a, a phenomena that you will probably be aware of I've become more aware of it uh, since dropping my kids at school. But it's this. Um, if you don't have time to get ready in the morning, if you're, busy, you're a busy person. I, think, I don't want to be sexist here, but I do think this is more for women. Uh, and you think, I haven't got time to wash my hair. I haven't got time to sort of pick out an outfit. But I don't want people to think that I'm like really scummy. So I know what I'll do. I'll put on my gym clothes. I will put on my gym clothes and I will go to where I need to go, whatever public space that might be. But I'll wear my gym clothes, I'll throw my hair up into kind of like a nice messy ponytail and everyone will think, oh, she's off to the gym a bit later. But actually you have no intention of going to the gym. You just couldn't be bothered to wash your hair and get ready. And so you just put on your gym clothes. And I confess that I began to do this. It's all a bit of a rush in the morning in the Hughes family. And so I throw on my gym clothes. Sometimes I do exercise, but sometimes I do not. And my friend Nick began to take the mick out of me quite a bit for this because we would see each other in the playground at school and be like, oh, you're wearing your active wear. And he was referencing this um, clip on the internet that highlights this issue. Anyway, we decided at Gastric that we would go one better and make our own active wear video. So watch this. <laughs> 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 
So there you go. Um, we are clothed with power. You see what I've done there? And when we invite the Spirit of God to clothe us with power and then step out onto the campus into our public spheres of influence and we do nothing about it, we shy away. It's like putting on your active wear and then never, ever going to the gym. We are clothed with power. We are clothed with power. I want to end because I'd love, I'd love to pray. I'd love the opportunity for God to meet with us. So I'm going to, do you know, I'm going to stop short there because I, I don't want to run out of time. Let, let's, um, let's stand together. Actually, do you know what? I've changed my mind. Sit down. <laughs> sit down. <laughs> but you, Tom, you can come up. Thank you. That would be amazing. Let's just pray, actually. I'll stop saying silly things and let's pray. That would be great. Holy Spirit, we love you. We love you. Holy Spirit, I'm, I'm just, I love it that you're here. That the Holy Spirit that we read about in Ezekiel, the Holy Spirit that breathed life into Adam and Eve in Genesis, the Holy Spirit that breathed power into the disciples at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit that breathed life into those dry bones is here. You're here, Holy Spirit, and we invite you to do whatever you want to do in us. We invite you. We invite you. We say yes to you. And Spirit of God, I, I ask now that you would specifically be meeting with those that are struggling with disappointment, those that are feeling disillusioned, cynical, those that are battle-weary. Spirit of God, we thank you that you want to raise us up into a vast army, set apart, set on fire for you. But God, we... We allow you now, we, we, we give wholehearted permission that you meet us in those places of pain and disappointment now. Would you come? Would you come?